mankind fell in the Garden of Eden, that Adam would raise crops through the sweat of his brow. It was real interesting to see the first time that the word work was used in the Bible was when uh, Pharaoh made the Jews serve with rigor. And he told them, you're idle, you're idle, you're not working hard enough. So tonight I want to continue that thought, looking at it from another angle. The Bible has a lot to say about the subject of labor. And tonight I want to take a closer look at some of those things. Notice, first of all, things we shouldn't labor for. You know, the Bible lists two things that we shouldn't labor for. Number one, labor not to be rich. Proverbs 23 and verse 4. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. This godly counsel is, is in complete opposition to the philosophy of the world which promotes the idea of getting rich, the idea of lifestyles and the rich and famous. Now let me begin by saying there's nothing wrong with having money or nice things. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you've got to take some vow of poverty. Many misquote the verse found in 1 Timothy chapter 6 by stating, well, you know, money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. That's not what it says. 1 Timothy 6.10 declares, for the love of money is the root of all evil. There's the problem. There's a big difference between the love of money and money. We are told in Proverbs not to labor to be rich. Why? Because inevitably what happens, money becomes our God. Many worship the Almighty God. And that's what happens. Very few people can <clears throat> handle being rich and wealthy and not let it take them away from God. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we are given the reason why we shouldn't labor to be rich. Why don't you turn over there? 1 Timothy chapter 6 gives us the reason why. Here's the way I look at it. Matthew 6.33 tells us, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So in other words, put simply, if you put God first, if it's God's intention for you to be wealthy or well off, it's going to fall into place. And you won't have to do nothing to work at it. He's just going to bless everything you do by opening up the window of heaven and pouring you out a blessing that you can't contain, whether it's financially or possessions or a better job, or as Rich said, having your health. You can't put a price on having your health. I would rather be rich in my health than have all the money in the world because all the money in the world can't buy you an extra day of life. So... That's the key there. So many folks are working and trying to be rich. Working at it, working at it. Throwing all their energy and time into being rich. When God says, look, I'll take care of that. First Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Okay. Note the following. We shouldn't labor to be rich because, number one, as it says right here, you can't take anything with you from this world. Many religions, like the Egyptians, they would bury the king with all of his wealth so that when he would go into the next world, he would have his wealth. They would even bury his servants alive so that when he died and went to the next life, his servants would be there to serve him. Guess what? Them servants died, that wealth was left behind, and someone ravaged many of those tombs and took that wealth that was in the, in the uh, Pharaoh's chambers because you can't take it with you. There's been stories of people that, instead of being buried in a casket, were buried in their favorite car. There's brand new vets and brand new Cadillacs that are underground because that person wanted to leave this world in their car, and that car ain't doing nobody no good Especially that person because you can't take it with you. The Bible declares in Matthew 6.21, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Those that labor to be rich have their reward here in this world. That's as good as it's going to get. That is their reward. But they 
They'll have no eternal rewards in heaven. Secondly, all that really matters is having food and clothing. That's what we're told in verse 8. Having food and clothing, let us therewith be content. Had a friend that lost everything in a fire. And he said afterwards, he goes, you know, you really understand how light you can travel through this world after you lost everything. Everything else is just window dressing. Our society has been brainwashed to think we can't live without certain items. Some churches are actually doing a cyber fast. Rather than fasting by not eating, they're fasting by not using any of their gadgets for a week. No TV, no internet, no computer, no cell phone. Cyber fasting. I never heard of that, but you know what's it? It's interesting because we convince ourselves we can't live without those gadgets. A lot of folks would go into panic at the thought of even going a day without those things. You watch enough commercials on TV and they'll tell you, you can't live without this and you can't live without that. Yes, we can. Number three, laboring to be rich causes many to fall into temptations that end up destroying them, according to verse 9. I think of people like Michael Jackson. Watch this special where he was in Las Vegas and he went to this store and he said, I'll take that and I'll take one of those and that and this and that. And the guy was looking at the price tag, 50000 30000 20000 same thing with Robin Williams. Preached on him a few weeks ago. This guy seemed to be on top of the world, was worth $50 million at one time. Had everything he could ever hope for. But he got depressed, he got discouraged, and he ended up killing himself. One just got weirder as time went on, and the other one just got depressed. So there it is. It causes many to fall into temptations and ends up destroying them. Number four, laboring to be rich can cause believers to err from the faith. That's what verse 10 says. Solomon is an example of this. He was the richest man that ever lived, but ended up turning, it ended up turning away from God. So what was the point of being rich if it turned you away from God? And then number five, laboring to be rich can turn you against God. Judas Iscariot is a perfect example about as that. Matthew was a tax collector. He probably was the most qualified to handle money and be the treasurer of the group of 12. I got a feeling he didn't want no part of it, spend his life cheating people, ripping people off. Right. When he got saved and God gave him a new heart, he had no interest in going down that road. So they elected Judas. Shows you how much they respected him, trusted him. Judas was stealing from the bag. No one knew it, but God knew it. Jesus knew it. And then later on, when that woman, as we saw it very well, might have been his sister, sold that ointment for a lot of money, he had a big uh, problem with it. And Jesus rebuked him because he had his eyes on that money. And from that point on, he looked to get money from the Pharisees to sell out Jesus, to betray Jesus. So that was his downfall. Betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, trying to give the money back. They didn't want it. That was blood money. They ended up using it to buy a burial plot for them. So laboring to be rich can cause you to turn against God. Those are just some of the reasons why we shouldn't labor to be rich. And there's a second thing we shouldn't labor for. Labor not for food that perishes. John chapter 6. Why don't we turn there? John chapter 6. Labor not for food that perishes. John chapter 6. Verse 26. This is interesting. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Here in this passage of Scripture, Jesus rebukes those who were following him for the wrong reason. He calls them out because they were following, following him, not because they believed he was the Messiah, the Son of God. He declares that the only reason they were following him is because of the bread they were given. Two different occasions he fed people, 5,000 and then another 8,000. He fed with fish and loaves of bread. And he flat out tells them, that's not the right reason to be following me. 
In verse 27, he tells them, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Just as Jesus spoke of salvation as receiving living waters, that you will never thirst again, here again he uses a symbolism, does the same thing, since he himself is the bread of life. He's telling them that the only meat or food that really matters is the meat of salvation. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Amen. So those are the two things we shouldn't labor for. Notice, secondly, some of the things that we should labor for. i got eight things, if I can hit them all. Eight things that we should labor for. Number one, just as we saw, don't labor for food that perishes. Labor for eternal food. We are told to labor for that meat which endures under everlasting life. Life which the Son of Man shall give unto you. The most important decision we will ever make concerns where we will spend eternity. And after that is the desire to have treasure in heaven. Those things are meat which endure unto eternity. Labor for those things. Labor for eternal things. Labor for the things of God. Amen. A second thing we should labor for, labor to help the poor and needy. Uh, Ephesians 4.28. Let's take a look at that. Ephesians 4.28 Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, there's that word again, working with his hands the things which is good that he may have to give to him that need it. Here is yet another verse that promotes the idea of work. That everyone needs to have a job and work. Because if you work, you won't have to steal. That's pretty clear. And if you don't steal, you won't have to worry about getting arrested or going to jail. And also, when you work, you'll also find that you'll have enough left over to help others in need. It's almost like a chain reaction. Along those same lines, you might not be called to be a missionary in some foreign land, but by supporting that missionary with your finances, you'll have a big part in his ministry. We just gave this missionary a good send-off. We can't support him, but we'll have a part of what he's doing there because of what we gave him. And so also with all the missionaries that we support. Amen. That's one way of supporting the need. But I mentioned this morning, for what we spend most weekends on food and entertainment, you can support a third world country. So maybe God will start coming to your hearts about supporting some private enterprises, whatever it may be. Maybe a missionary that we can't support. Uh, Bibles for the blind, or, or whatever it may be, God might lay a ministry upon your heart. And when you got a few extra dollars, you don't have to support them every week. But God may lay it on your heart to help you. Or just to help someone out within the church. Number three, labor to win lost souls. Philippians chapter 2, next book after Ephesians. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 15. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither, neither labored in vain. Here in this passage of Scripture, Paul reveals that what kept him going is knowing that he made an impact on the lives of those that had been lost, that were now gloriously saved. He said, that's worth it. That's worth it to me. If thoughts of discouragement ever came upon Paul, if he ever got weary in the way, when he got to thinking of those transformed lives, he knew his labor was not in vain. I felt that same way when, when Tina and her daughter walked in. Sometimes you, you pour your life into someone, and you never, you never see any results from it. And you start scratching your head thinking, is it worth it all? Is it worth it all? I'm investing in lies. And, and sometimes you might not see any gains from it. But, but what we got to remember is those seeds that were planted, sometimes it takes a lot of time for them seeds to come through, to fruition. Whether it's our children that aren't living for God. Whether it's a guy at work that gives us a hard time about our faith. Whether it's people that come to these doors and we don't know if we'll ever see them again. And just like with her. She came through these doors. It must have been about 10 years since I've, I've seen her in this church. 
So you never know. We leave that part to God. Just keep planting seeds like Christian Johnny Appleseed. Keep planting seeds and then leave the results with God. And then every once in a while, maybe when you're down and discouraged, maybe when you're thinking quick, maybe when you're wondering, like Paul, is it worth it all? Someone's going to come through these doors. Your children, your grandchildren, your neighbor, your, your co-worker, people that you gave a track to years ago and forgot all about. Kids that you maybe had in a Sunday school class or a youth group. There they are. Pastor, thank you for sharing with me what, what faith is all about. So that's what keeps us going. Labor to win lost souls. There will be days when you're running them empty, when you're getting weary in the way. There will be times when the devil's in your head trying to convince you you're wasting your time. Don't get discouraged. Don't listen to the enemy's lies because there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. Hallelujah. So if they're rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents, we got to do some rejoicing here. Number four, labor to support the weak. Uh, Acts chapter 20, let's take a look at that. Labor to support those who are weak. Acts chapter 20. Beginning with verse 32. This was Paul's farewell message. These were parting words from the Apostle Paul. And he said this. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. And I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Here in this passage of scripture is one of Paul's last messages, literally parting words of wisdom to the brethren. Here Paul tells Christians that they should labor to help the weak, to support the weak. Support the weak spiritually, first of all. Take them under your wing. Be a mentor to someone. Encourage them. Be a friend of them that are weak by taking an interest in their life. It might be picking them up for church. It might be having a cup of coffee with them. It might be having a Bible study with them. It might be just showing them some kindness. Showing them some friendship. Support the weak spiritually. If we don't, they're not going to last very long as Christians. If they come here and don't see the love of God, they'll be in the door and out just as quick. It takes a lot of time for Christians to get strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. It's just like a little baby. You don't let that little baby say, hey, look, you're on your own. We gave birth to you now. You've got to feed yourself, take care of yourself. We would say, well, that's silly. But it's no different when someone gets saved and they're just babes in Christ. It's the same thing. We've got to put a bottle in their mouth, spiritually change their diapers, carry them around when they're whining, when they're crying, until they can fend for themselves and get established in the faith. Otherwise, it's just like throwing out a baby with the bath water. Support the weak by helping them. Give them a good Bible. Man, how much can that cost? Give them a good Bible so that they have something to study and that they can grow in the Word. Maybe it's giving them a few bucks so they can get to church. I mean, is that, is that too much to ask? Giving them a, we'll just slip a few dollars. I know you guys are already doing that, so I'm just saying that these are the things that go through my mind. Whatever it takes to get them out to church, that they can get them to the preacher. Go ahead, Rich. You got to don't stop it. I'll take a break right here. Yeah, uh, it's funny that you should come to that group of pieces of scripture because my mom, God rest her soul, has been saying this as far back as I can remember, and my dad says it to to this day. That whether we know or not, Giver is the receiver. Amen. And uh, you know what I mean? And I know what she means, but I didn't know when she started saying it. Yeah. But I know it now. Amen, brother. Here's the thing. Whatever it is that God lays on your heart to do, whatever it may be, because here's the thing. If we don't help those that are weak to get strong, they're going to stay weak. And eventually they'll just fade out. Mm -hmm. Paul is right by calling this a labor because it takes a lot of work to get them established in the faith. 
I call it investing in lives. That's what I look at. Whatever time or effort or labor I spend in helping someone, and there's several people that I'm working on, it's work. It's labor. They fall down, we gotta lift them up. They 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 stumble spiritually, they start to drift, we gotta carry them for a while. Till they can get strong enough to live the Christian life without having hands-on help. Number five, labor in your prayer life. Colossians chapter 3. This is good stuff right here. Colossians chapter 3 tells us to labor in our prayer life. Colossians 3.12. Is that the right chapter? Colossians 4.12, I'm sorry. Colossians 4.12. Go back to verse 11. In Jesus, which is called justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers. There's that word. Under the kingdom of God, which has been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he had a great zeal for you, and them that are of Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. Here in this passage of Scripture, we are told of a Christian, a co-laborer, I like that word, a fellow laborer of the Apostle Paul named Epaphras. Epaphras was a prayer warrior, who we are told always laboring fervently for you in prayer. That's how he's remembered. What a great remembrance. The Scripture records Epaphras as a prayer warrior, Epaphras, Epaphras labored to pray fervently. Why? Because prayer takes work. Make no mistake about it. Prayer takes work. On the night he was betrayed, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, we are told that Jesus prayed and his sweat was as great drops of blood. That's a medical phenomenon that only happens when someone is under intense stress or great pressure. The capillaries... Uh, constrict and the blood literally pours out through the sweat, through the pores as drops of sweat and blood. I believe the forces of darkness were hitting Jesus with everything they had that night, which is why Jesus said he was sorrowful unto death. Jesus was under attack by the enemy, but he prayed his way through it. Prayer takes work. We must labor when it comes to prayer. Why? Number one, because we are in a spiritual war. The devil trembles at the weakest Christian upon his knees and he will fight any Christian that he sees praying. He don't really care if you're in church. He really don't care if you even read your Bible. But when he sees a Christian get a hold of prayer, he's going to attack. Because that's where the power is generated. The devil is going to do whatever he can to try to discourage us from praying because prayer changes things. Prayer gets God's attention. So be aware of that. You decide you're going to start praying more. Don't be surprised. I'm not afraid of it, but I'm just telling you. He's going to try to distract you. The phone's going to ring. Someone's going to knock at the door. The dog's going to start barking. Whatever it may be, because he doesn't want you to pray. We should just pray that much harder if that happens. Number two, prayer is a labor because prayer takes time. Nothing is accomplished with a little five minute, now I lay me down to sleep kind of praying. Nothing's accomplished. The Lord Jesus would often rise a great while before morning or pray long into the night. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 declares, pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean pray for eight hours. It means be in a spirit of continual prayer throughout the day. Colossians 4.2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Ephesians 6.18, pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Here's the thing. The more you give yourself to prayer, the more things God will burden your heart about to pray. <clears throat> That's why our prayer time gets longer. You might have a little short prayer list, knock that out in 10 minutes, but as time goes on, God's going to lay other things on your heart, other people on your heart, and you're going to realize, man, 10 minutes isn't going to cut it. There's a whole lot of people capped on my prayers, inter interceding in prayer. You'll find 
find that your prayer list keeps getting longer because there's a whole lot of folks that need our prayers. The third reason why prayer takes work is the fact that our flesh is weak. That night Jesus was betrayed. He asked the disciples to stay up with him and watch and pray. Jesus was about to face his darkest hour and he wanted the apostles to have an all night prayer meeting to take his back. Jesus went off alone to pray. Three different times he went and checked on the disciples and three different times he found them asleep. And he said in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In that statement, Jesus comes to the root of the problem when it comes to prayer. The spirit living within us, the spirit of God, indeed is willing, but our flesh is weak. And our flesh has no interest in the things of God. And our flesh does not like to pray. So what we must do is take control through the Holy Spirit and let our flesh know who's boss. We've got to get our flesh under control so that God is able to work in and through us. As long as we're in these bodies of flesh, there's going to be a constant struggle, a battle, a day-to-day -day tug of war between our flesh and the Spirit of God dwelling within us. And depending on who you're yielding yourself to, that's who's going to be in control. We must labor in our prayers. Number six, labor to not be a burden to others. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Labor to not be a burden to others. First Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning with verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preach unto you the gospel of God, your witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe. I mentioned in Sunday school that the Apostle Paul was a tent maker. That was his trade, his profession. And whenever he wasn't supported through love offerings uh, on his missionary journey, he would go back to making tents. To make ends meet. Because he, he, he wasn't about to beg for any handouts. And he wasn't going to borrow any money. And as we're told here in verse 9, he didn't want to be a burden to others. Didn't want to be chargeable to others, which means indebted to others. He didn't want to have to go around town, hey Paul, where's that 10 bucks I left you? Hey Paul, you, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me. Paul would spend the day doing missionary work, teaching, preaching reaching out to lost souls with the gospel. Then when his day was finally over, he would begin his second job of making tents so that he would have a few dollars to eat and drink or to buy, uh, buy a ticket on the ships that he would use. So that's what he did. He didn't have to answer to anyone. In Sunday school, I mentioned the importance of having a work ethic, an attitude of doing whatever it takes to get the job done, whether it's in your home, or whether it's in church, we got to have a work ethic. I mentioned this morning that many don't have a work ethic. In fact, they shun anything that requires hard work or extended labor. Uh, cap me out. I mentioned this one fellow that came to this church years ago. He said, man, if I knew this job was going to take work, I wouldn't have volunteered for it. Okay. Well, there you go. Good. They're looking for an easy way in life. But I truly believe that working builds character and it teaches us that anything can be achieved if we're willing to work at it. I mentioned the book of Nehemiah. They accomplished great things for the glory of God. They rebuilt those walls in record time. Why? Because we're told that people had a mind to work. Hallelujah. No telling what can be accomplished if God's people have a mind to work. Number seven, labor to enter into God's rest. Hebrews chapter 4. Now this passage might almost seem like a contradiction here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Okay. Friends, the good news is there is a rest for the people of God. 
Now, I don't have time to go into it, but when you're walking in the Spirit, you're resting in God. God doesn't expect us to live this life in our own strength because our strength wears out. So when we're entering into His rest now, today, it's walking in the Spirit and letting God direct your path. Letting God be your strength. Letting God fight your battle. So there's an immediate rest. 